I'm Professor Ben Bickman. I am a research scientist and professor of cell biology. This week is a bit different because I'm not discussing a particular topic, but rather sharing with you the good news that I'm happy to announce that my new book is coming out. The release date for the new book is July 11, and here it is. Now, you're going to notice some similarities in the title. My first book, which was Why We Get Sick, here over my shoulder, um, this is the follow-up, the companion book, How Not to Get Sick. Now, I want to just go through the book a little bit with you. When I first considered writing the book Why We Get Sick, it was really because I thought I, – I, I worried that there was a part of the medical conversation that was missing the main character, namely insulin resistance. And so by way of the kind of personal journey that I thought I might share with you, in the life of a professor – there's one achievement that stands out. You would think that when you're going through your PhD, when you're going through your postdoctoral fellowship, that the goal is simply to get hired as a tenured track professor. In reality, the goal is to get tenure. For me, once I got tenure at my university, I had an honest conversation in my office right here with myself. I was struck by what I worried was some of the irrelevance of academia, namely peer-reviewed publications, that as a scientist, the main metric of success, well, it's twofold. Am I getting grants to fund my research, but am I publishing peer-reviewed science manuscripts? Now, as a professor with undergraduate students, that's something that's important to me because I want to mentor these students and help them achieve their next professional goals. But if I'm being honest with myself, as all academics ought to be, as we all ought to be, I had to admit that these peer-reviewed papers really didn't do much to actually help someone's life, that the average individual would never read these peer-reviewed science manuscripts and would never have any benefit from them because of that. And so then I asked myself if my knowledge set about metabolic health and fat cell hypertrophy and insulin resistance as a key contributor to chronic disease, if it's valuable, am I not obligated to find a way to share it? And that was the beginning of not only my social media efforts, including Insulin IQ, this, you're watching this on the YouTube channel, um, whether it was Instagram or X or any social media platform, that was purely based um, and created from my desire to find a direct way of teaching metabolic ideas to people. At the same time, I w realized that no one had written a book about insulin resistance directly. But in Why We Get Sick, I framed it in a few parts. I wanted the reader to become familiar with what insulin resistance is, where it comes from, so the origins, why it matters, so highlighting the diseases that come from insulin resistance, and that's the bulk of the book. And then lastly, end with what to do about it. So again, sort of four parts, a book with four parts. What is insulin resistance? Where does it come from? Why it matters and what to do about it. Now, the what to do about it part, um, the original version of the book, it was extraordinarily modest. Uh, I had very simple ideas there. And then the publisher, Ben Bella publisher and my editor said, look, we got to put a little more meat here. Any of you who have connected with me for some time may have sort of learned my philosophy um, when it comes to implementing plans for addressing insulin resistance. And my general view is I'm a teacher. I'm a professor. And I love that job, um, by the way. I liked the idea and still do of being someone who can share ideas and share principles and then let you work it out. You decide how best to implement them. And that's what I did in, in Why We Get Sick. Now, however, some people want a little more than that. Some people want a little more direction, a little more specifics. That starts to put me, um, not only is it not particularly my strengths, um, but it also puts me in a bit of a weird position because I'm not a coach. I'm not a lifestyle coach. I'm not a nutrition coach. I'm not a personal trainer. And speaking of food and exercise, those are two things we're going to revisit in just a moment when we start talking about how not to get sick. But as much as I'm not a nutritionist and I'm not a personal trainer, I know a lot about those things. That's just not something I 
enjoy. That's not a role I want to play. I like being a professor rather than the coach per se. Does that make sense? It's kind of an odd dynamic here and a, a frank um, admission of my own weaknesses. Nevertheless, after with the popularity of why we get sick, a lot of there has been a lot of request for some specific ideas on how to take the the raw science of where insulin resistance comes from and, and uh, incorporate that into a more explicit plan of food and exercise guidance. That really was the basis for how not to get sick. Now, after everything I just admitted, you're thinking, well, Ben, you just said you're not a coach. You're not a nutritionist. You're not a personal trainer. And that's not, and you don't want to be. Um, that was why I brought on Diana. So I have a co-author on this book, um, which I am so grateful for, for reasons that I'll get into in just a moment. But this is a book of two parts where the first part of the book is the hard science of, of revisiting insulin resistance and then helping you understand where you are at. And first of all, um, how you determine your own insulin resistance status, and then following that up with the, um, the scientific evidence supporting some of the approaches that we get into in the book. That sort of starts to finally get incorporated into um, into how not to get sick. Like you can see some of the figures. In fact, in some instances, there are figures that I've recreated from talks that I've given. In this particular case, it's me talking about um, physiological insulin resistance and some of the myths and misunderstandings that come along with it. For the first time I'm aware of, what I've done here is identify what I consider to be the best clinical tests and in some instances, some at-home assessments that you can do as the reader in order to understand, in order to answer that question, am I insulin resistant? Um, but so I have, first of all, these insulin-based tests. And then as you read through the book, you, you have these nice little charts where if you're able to get any of these tests done, you're able to um, put yourself into a, into a particular range. And that range gives you a score of one to three. So I have these insulin-based tests including my favorite, the adipose IR score. You can read all about it. It's my favorite one that gives you insight into the state of your fat cells directly. In other words, how insulin resistant are your fat cells, which is where insulin resistance starts. But again, every score, uh, every um, clinical marker you have, that number will give you a score of one to three. There's the insulin-based tests. Then there are the lipid based tests because while some people can't get insulin measured too often, we always get our lipids measured. So I talk about the triglyceride glucose index. I talk about the triglyceride HDL in, uh, ratio. And then ultimately, as you've been going through these tests, you've been giving yourself a score of one, two, or three. And then I ask you to add them up. And that puts you into a category. In fact, I kind of have it um, demonstrated here where you're going to put in, be put into a place uh, where when you start reading further into the action plan, you're going to be put into one of three categories. Are you currently insulin sensitive and you want to maintain it? That's not, most people are not. Remember, the statistics are quite sobering that most people are insulin resistant. But if you're among the lucky few, you may just be in a position where you want to maintain your insulin sensitivity, which is a great position to be in. You may be a person who's mildly insulin resistant and you want to just sort of reverse that um, quickly or to get out of it, to prevent from going any further. That's the prevent phase. And then the reverse phase is all of your scores add up to suggest that you are very insulin resistant and you got to turn that around as quickly as you can. Then I start getting into these four pillars, which you've heard me talk about before. The first one is touching on the relevance of fasting, and I really make the case. I look over a lot of the evidence. I talk about one of my heroes of physiology, namely George Cahill. Um, you're going to love that part if you are interested ever in sort of any of the history of it. Um, but you know, you see some of these figures looking at insulin levels, and I explain why fasting is the fastest way to lower insulin. And we talk about some of the different strategies for fasting, but I always try make an a point to remind you, the student slash reader, how you end a fast matters more than how long you fast. And then I get in speaking of how you end your fast, then I get into these um, managing macros um, because managing macros matters most. So we talk about prioritizing protein, 
I have an emphasis, of course, on animal source proteins, but I highlight the relevance of uh, plant proteins, especially the value of fermentation. Um, a, a fermented plant protein is very, very different than a, a, you know, a raw plant protein that has not undergone any fermentation. I talk about branched chain amino acids, um, a very popular supplement, and I kind of break that down a little bit because there's evidence linking branched chain amino acids to insulin resistance. Very, um, I would say very problematic evidence that's been a little misunderstood. I emphasize the value of fat and show you reproduce a figure from human studies just reminding you that fat does not increase insulin um, despite the debates. I talk about, of course, controlling carbohydrates um, finally as the last macro to manage. And just as a point of interest, I emphasize this figure when I talk about how dietary carbohydrates um, are not needed. Uh, that's not to be understood as me saying that blood glucose is not needed. Blood glucose is needed. And thankfully, um, through gluconeogenesis, the body is perfectly capable of making all of the glucose that we may need. And I just make a point of emphasizing that most of the glucose we have in our blood actually comes from lactate, one of the more misunderstood parts of human metabolism. By the way, humans do not make lactic acid. We make lactate. Okay, now I also, you just heard me a moment ago talk about the value of fermented plant proteins. I am a fan of fermentation and I talk about some of my personal um, fermented food favorites, especially when it does come to carbohydrates, which is the main macro that is fermented. Bacteria love eating carbohydrates. They don't touch fats. They don't touch proteins. They will eat those carbs, which is a, a sort of a particular benefit for us because there's less of the carb, which we don't care about. We want the fats and proteins. And in the process, the bacteria, after consuming the carbs, end up giving us some really healthy fats, namely short-chain fats. Now, ultimately, as I mentioned a moment ago, after going through all of these um, principles that you will take advantage of to address your insulin resistance, it does put you into these three categories, reverse, prevent, or maintain. And I split that up a bit um, with regards to the macronutrients, because depending on where you are, it does suggest an inherent difference in your ability to handle perhaps carbohydrates. And so that influences a little bit of the strategy moving forward. And then, and then lastly, speaking of moving, I talk a little bit about exercise. Um, I break down the relevance of the liver in exercise and how that manages, that affects blood glucose, especially heavy emphasis on the role of skeletal muscle, which just by mass is most of what we are. Most of our body mass, when we're standing on the scale, if there's any particular tissue, it's muscle that matters most. And combined with the metabolic rate of muscle and its ability to really eat glucose as a fuel, it's no surprise that muscle mass matters enormously. And so I have very, very strong thoughts on the power of uh, the value of exercise, and that comes into play um, in that chapter here, where I really review the evidence of, of exercise in particular. Um, then, as I mentioned, we get to the plan. And the plan, um, as I showed you earlier, breaks down into those three categories, depending on where you are, whether it is reverse. And then if you are in the position of reverse, you are full insulin resistant. We sort of have this transition where as you've been doing some of this, how do you know when it's time to kind of graduate to the next level? And it slides you into that prevent phase. Um, and then eventually, hopefully, or maybe you're one of the lucky few where you're already there, you're in the maintain phase. And then Diana, wonderful gal that she is, extensive experience. She then really provides some direct exercise plans with just lovely pictures and then incredible meals that you can see based on the color coding is broken down into the various macronutrients that I'd out, well, the three macros that um, split into the ratios that, that we'd looked at with regards to re um, reverse, prevent, and maintain. So the dietary portion gets split into those three categories. So it makes it really, really simple as you want to look at various meals that will help you in those three categories. Um, you'll have them all laid out, not only in beautiful, full color pictures, um, but also just absolutely delicious um, meals uh, from top to bottom. Her involvement 
in, in the, the actual meal and exercise planning allowed me to stay in the realm in which I'm very comfortable, namely that of professor. I want to teach you ideas um, so that you understand what's happening. I always, I have to believe there is value in just understanding the process as much as a lot, most people just want pure plan. Just tell me what to do. That's valuable. Of course it is. But I, I just have to believe there's value in maybe added motivation um, for the plan itself, but there has to be some value in understanding why these things work. 